Welcome to All Heart with Paul Cardall. Before we get started, I have a giveaway. All you gotta do is go to my website, paulcardall.com, and my last name is spelled C-A-R-D-A-L-L. So go to paulcardall.com and join the All Heart Club. You'll receive the song I've never made available anywhere. It's very easy. Just go to the website, paulcardall.com, join the All Heart Club and receive this gorgeous piece of music. My guest today is the lead actor on a show I can't get enough of. Jonathan Rumi plays Jesus of Nazareth in the Chosen series. Jonathan is an award-winning actor, director, and producer. You may have seen him on The Rock's HBO series Ballers or CBS's Chicago Med, but this current role that he is in, he is quickly rising as one of today's brightest stars. And in the coming weeks, I'm going to dive even deeper into The Chosen because my guest will be Dallas Jenkins, who is the director and the writer. And we talked about casting the role of Jesus, which is not easy to do. So that's why today's interview focuses on the personal life and the heart of Jonathan Rumi. What is it that he's done in his life to prepare him to play the Son of God? But first, here's a scene from The Chosen where Jesus heals a blind man with birth paralysis. If you're listening to the audio, you can just go to my website under the podcast link and you can watch the scene. You, by whose authority do you teach? Answer me. If you are willing, Rabbi, you know you can. Hey, I'm talking to you. By whom do you teach? Certainly not the authority of any rabbi from Nazareth. Where did you study? Your faith is beautiful. Son, take heart. Your sins are forgiven. Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Right. But I ask you, which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or rise up and walk? It's easy to say anything, no? But to show you and so that you may know that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. I say to you, my son, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. going to talk about the chosen but i want to talk about you sure i i've seen a lot of interviews with you with you know everybody wants to know about the chosen um i want to know about jonathan because mm -hmm. you don't just stumble into a role like that uh, 
I was in Cartagena on a, a film set with Jim Caviezel. He's, he's playing wow. Tim Ballard, who is a uh, former uh, Homeland Security agent that is heavily involved in rescuing children from sex trafficking. Is this the one that's coming out in yeah, the fall? Sound of, the Sound of Freedom film that uh, is being done. I'm excited to see that film. That film looks amazing. It's, it's such a heavy subject. And I was part of their board for a long yeah. time. And I went down just to observe what was going on. I didn't, but, uh, you know, I, I met Jim and he said that was the best. You know, this is the second most important role for him mm -hmm. other than playing Jesus Christ. And I thought, wow, that's, you know, right. because the man got electrocuted playing Jesus Christ. Yeah. He ended up having to have heart <laughs> um, uh, Yeah, yeah. So hopefully. Hopefully that's not the case. No, I got, I, well, who knows? I mean, you know, at this point, our my job as a, a faithful Christian, uh, if I'm really walking the walk, is to just uh, offer, my, you know, offer up myself and as, as a vessel for the project and allow God's will to be done um, through me. And if uh, I'm sure there was going to be some kind of suffering and, and as a, as a Catholic, especially, we're we're big on offering up our suffering, you know, or and and uh, in the same way that the saints did, you know, martyrs and people that suffered for years for for the sake of Christ, and it helps it helps deal with the suffering, you know what I mean? To to kind of know that the the person responsible for your salvation went through this already, so uh, it it becomes much easier to deal with suffering when you're offering it up. Um, to to Christ. So if that's if that's what's meant to happen, then so be it. But uh, hopefully, I won't get electrocuted or uh, or have to have uh, surgery. You know that level of commitment as a human being, but also in your career. Mm -hmm. Are you a method actor? The short answer is yes. I, I would consider myself a method actor because I use things like sense memory. I use effective memory. I use. Um, um, elements of my own life. That's the biggest thing with with uh, being a method actor is you essentially are are drawing from experiences in your own life. And some people choose not to do that, or they divorce themselves from um, you know uh, delving into their own personal lives, which I think deprives us of of a ton of richness. So I've had kind of a chest cold, so I get the crackling of my lungs, and maybe if you can character and heal me, that would help. But uh... <laughs> Let's go back to your childhood because you have a, to my understanding, and, and please correct me, your father is Egyptian and Greek Orthodox, and your mother yes. is American and Roman Catholic. She, uh, yeah, she, she was raised on a farm in Ireland and, and came out in her 20s to the United States. My father was uh, raised in the city of Cairo, and then he uh, traveled to the United States in the mid to late 60s as well. And then they met in New York City um, and then started a life. And, and I was raised in New York City and then we moved to the suburbs. Uh, and then um, there wasn't the uh, quite. Uh, so I was I was baptized Greek Orthodox and um, my my parents were married in a Greek Orthodox church. Um, and, and for my mother, like, you know, it's there was no they're so similar uh, and um, in, in how in their you know, theology uh, um, in, in so many ways that it wasn't a big deal. Um, and then when we moved to um, the suburbs of Long Island, um, there wasn't really an Orthodox community that we, you know, found and then that felt, you know, like home for us. So um, we started going to a Catholic church and my dad well, went to Catholic school as a kid uh, in Egypt. Um, so it was, he was kind of raised with, with both orthodoxy and Catholicism. So it, again, there shifting back was, you know, for, for my dad to shift over, uh, there was no real, um, uh, conflict, you know, um, theological or, or liturgical, uh, or, you know, or, um, religious conflict for him. And so we, we, uh, myself and my sisters made our first communion in our confirmation, in the Catholic church. And then, um, yeah, just kind of, uh, so I was raised with the okay. faith. Be being a Catholic in Egypt all those years ago, is that a common thing? Um, Christianity, I mean, Christians were and are a, mi a minority. There are a um, diminishing minority 
uh, or I should say, I mean, yeah, they're, they're a minority that's diminishing in numbers even still to this day, which is pretty heart rending. And so I'm, I'm trying to do as much as I can with, you know, my own sort of um, work here with some of the organiza organizations I work with to, you know, uh, deliver aid to persecuted Christians in the Middle East and seen as being outside of the system. They get treated a bit differently, you know? So you play the drums. Music was a, a major part of my life for a long time. I'm actually an ASCAP member as well. Um, and um, I wrote my first song a few years back, um, which I was pretty proud of. And, and uh, I was with a band for about three and a half, four years, which uh, for me, my, my involvement ended in, I think, early 2017 because we had been touring and we were overseas and, and, uh, um, and it just got to be, uh, you know, it's a, it's not an easy lifestyle as many of your listeners, I'm sure who have been in bands know that, uh, you know, road life, uh, life on the road is, is not uh, the easiest, especially when you're, uh, you know, a small band in our case, a bar band. Um, and, uh, but it was fun. It was, it was full of right. lots of, adventures but it's not it's also not the healthiest lifestyle and i found that it was sort of diverting me off of um the path that i had deemed as as part of my my mission to and the reason i came out to los angeles was not to be in a band it was to to uh, work as an actor so um it's sure. fascinating and i still play i still play with people um obviously not since covid um but you know i've got a bunch of friends that whenever They've got some gigs. They're sing singer songwriters. Whenever they they um they got some gigs coming up, I'll I'll hop in for a set. And you, usually now it's it's mostly like percussion, like cajon and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah, and even in the band, the, the bar band, like we were in smaller venues, and I I kind of um, amplified acoustically my sound as a as a percussionist. Um, and I would you know I would use brushes with my cajon and sort of play it almost like like a kit, yeah. you know, where I kept yeah. my my right hand is my bass drum and my left hand is my snare drum. And I literally have like one of those brushes I'd never seen before. And for like the year, the first year I was with this band playing Cajon, I was breaking my hand every night. I was like taping up my hand because I was just, we were playing, you know, high energy, you know, rock and pop music and stuff where I'm like, I can't sustain this. You know, I would need two days to ice my hands and for it to be able to, you know, to play again until I discovered brushes. And that was like, that changed my life. Uh, and so we literally just learned, uh, we, we added another percussionist. And so we just kind of became this little percussive Frankenstein of a, of a, of a band that uh, sounded great and uh, just had a bunch of different voices and, and uh, was uh, very uh, much welcomed by a lot of um, places that uh, clubs and, and bars that didn't want a full drum kit and so it and it was very portable and it was, so it worked really well for for a long time and when you put a couple of mics on those things nobody knows the difference people are like why are you making all that sound with that box I'm like, yep, it's just a box me in a box what are some of your musical influences what do you like to listen to <laughs> no i mean i couldn't narrow it down to one i mean i i listen to such a wide spectrum of stuff i mean i you know, um, the police were a huge influence on me early on. Iron Maiden was a huge influence on my drumming. Like I learned to, I, I mostly learned to drum. I got the basics through lessons. And then I mostly learned to drum just by copying what I heard, playing what I heard and trying to figure out and decipher what I heard and break down. So um, Genesis, you know, um, uh, the police, U2, um, Led Zeppelin, mostly rock stuff. And then um it would get a little bit heavier i started listening to slayer at one point and and you know and going to shows and experiencing mosh pits and so that kind of had a little bit of an influence but it just for like everyday playing it was mostly like progressive rock i got into guys like uh, dave weckel and 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 um with chick korea band and and then i started you know getting into jazz and rush and and uh Toto and and Vinny, guys like Vinny Cagliuto who was playing was just so super clean and just like like a metronome and you know so it it, it sort of you know ranged all over the places as my needs to 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 expand and and further my education as a as a player um, you know necessitated. That's so cool. I love it. 
Yeah, Neil Peart. He's my uh, God rest his soul. Yeah, what a loss, yeah. man. And the lyrics he would write, everything about it was a fantastic band. But uh, yeah, that makes sense to be a fan of Police and all those bands playing drums and everything. I've been, you know, going through like all your training. You've had extensive training. Did did you decide to become an actor, or did an act did acting decide for you? It kind of found me. I had um, no no designs to be an actor whatsoever. I was, uh, you know, I was a very extremely shy, introverted kid. I was also an artist, a visual artist. I would, I was a really good illustrator. Um, I thought I might end up doing that at one point. Um, and I won a couple of awards as a high school student for for some of my work, and it was shown in on a couple of galleries and and um and so i uh I thought I might do that and then i I realized I had a real love for film, and so I wanted to try to um, start directing myself towards like visual effects, something where I could incorporate um my my art uh my visual art into film, which I didn't know much about, but I wanted to learn. But I was also a mimic from the time I was a young kid. So I always had, and that was the musician's ear that I think that came into play. And uh, and I thought like if, if there was anything I'd ever want to do, like, you know, as a, as talent in front of the camera, it wouldn't be in front of a camera, be in front of a microphone. Voiceover would be the thing that I want to do. Like I was a huge fan of the Simpsons, and, you know, growing up like that was a huge thing for me. And so I thought, if there was anything I would do, it would be, maybe be voiceover. And so when I was in college, I, actually a couple of years after I got out of college, um, there was a show at the time, um, and this is totally dating myself, but who cares, um, called Celebrity Deathmatch and on MTV, yes. which all, if you remember that show, all of these clay animated celebrities would fight each other to the death and it went on for a few seasons. And so one day, I, you know, I, I just thought, well, why I could do some of the the impressions for the celebrities better than what they the people that they've got, you know, for some of them, I was a bit of a chip on my shoulder. I'm like, I could do that, you know. And so I literally found the casting director's address when they used to put out like mailing addresses and, and information in a little book called the Ross Reports. And I sent her a letter. I wrote a letter and, and just said, hey, I, I could do impressions you know and and i'd love to audition for the show and like i didn't hear anything for like a few months and then she finally um i think i included my email address at the time because um those were still fairly yeah. new um and AOL. <laughs> AOL. aol yeah it literally was an aol address and um she wrote me back and said hey you know call this number and leave a recording of like your best impression and so i did and and then she started emailing me auditions. And after about two or three months of random auditions, I started, I booked my first uh, job, which was uh, voicing Tony Danza in, in, uh, in um, Celebrity Give, give us a little bit of Tony. What does Tony sound like? Uh, Tony Maselli is kind of like uh, Angela. What are you doing? You know, sort of along those lines there. I forget what the monologue was. <laughs> But it was this very gruff Italian guy, and most of whom I grew up with. So um, it was a pretty easy, easy. It was a that was a lob for me. So I hit that one, and then uh, and then I ended up doing uh, about uh, twenty five different characters over the course of three seasons for the show. Uh, and then that got me uh, when I wanted to go a little further. I was like, okay, I felt a little comfortable. I said, I said to the casting director, I said, hey, you know, I'm, I think I want to learn more about voiceover. And she's like, well, here's a guy you should study with. He's one of the best in the city. And so I went and took a class with him and he was great. And um, I started finding my my voice, so to speak, uh, with uh, with voiceover. That and then Stuart Dillon. he wrecked Stuart Dillon. Yeah, very good. Um, Stuart Dillon, you do your homework. Um, and uh, and Stuart uh, connected me with uh, my first agent and uh, who was a commercial agent. And then she started sending me out for stuff and I started booking. And um, I was also at the time, I became a location scout during that time um, when I was starting voiceover. And so I, I started working on, I was working on um, giant studio pictures as a, as a scout, as an assistant, and then a scout, and then eventually a location manager, You're still assistant manager. You're still in New York at this time. 
Still in New York, yeah. Um, and then at, when I would be working on a film, I'd always just kind of check the script and see if there's anything like a small part that maybe I could audition for. And so, you know, I would tell casting directors, uh, you know, I learned about headshots and putting a re resume together. And um, I did my first play, and which was playing a drummer in a band, uh, oddly enough, um, which was yep. great. Um, a show called Rock Show. And then uh, I ended up um, getting a, uh, a couple of auditions for some of the films I worked on and booking them. And then that kind of led to other things. And then I think by that time I was, I had been doing, I'd been acting from the time I booked my first episode of Celebrity Deathmatch to the time I just about was ready to leave New York was about 10 years. Okay. And then I came to LA in 2000, uh, end of 2009, beginning of 2010. And the main sure. switch to go to LA was because there was more role opportunity out there. Yeah. Once, once the financial, uh, once the housing market sort of dropped out, you know, it, it became, um, a sort of, um, a real uh, opportunity to examine what it is that I wanted to do with my life. And, you know, I thought it's either now or never, and now is the perfect time to kind of reset and take this shot and see if I really have what it takes to, to make it as an actor to, to really have a, a successful career in New York. A while there's, there was at the time, and there is even there was even more now up until COVID, obviously, there's more work than there's ever been in New York. Um, at the time, it, it wasn't as a burgeoning uh, a, a city with production and opportunities as, as Los Angeles. So I said, I might as well go A, where the weather is better, and B, where all of the projects get their right. start, which is Los Angeles. So I did. When you uh, decided to move out to LA, because obviously you're close to your mother and your father. Uh, a devout religious home yeah. and uh, you're making this move from a place they know is safe to this big new world out there. What was that like for them? Um, you know, I, I don't think it was an easy thing for them to hear, but they, I think they also recognized that God had given me gifts um, in this arena since I had been working a bit, you know, mm -hmm. um, even though it would, it didn't amount in those 10 years to what I was doing 10 years out here. Um, it, it was setting me up for something larger. And I think they kind of knew I felt I was sort of called uh, or I had, you know, a part of my destiny was, was coming out to Los Angeles. Um, but it was, of course, it was extremely difficult to, to leave them and, and for them to, to see me leave and, you know, I was no longer a, an hour train ride away from from mm -hmm. them coming home every weekend. So, um, uh, so it was it was tough. But uh, you know, they uh, they've been nothing but supportive um, from from the beginning. From from my yeah. uh, from everything I've ever done, they've they've been supportive of. They, I couldn't ask for two better parents, especially as an artist. Uh, in 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 at that time, leaving New York, you know particularly unstable, you know, uh, circumstances uh, to, to, to come out here. I couldn't ask for, for more support than, than what they gave me. I want to skip to that scene in The Chosen. And we're going to get to the, mm. how you ended up doing The Chosen. But there's a beautiful scene in there where Jesus is with his mom. Actually, that would be a terrible thing to behold. <laughs> my son. Ah, Andrew, you see, even my own mother will join us in the Song of Miriam. They've run out of wine. But it's only the first day. Yes, and it's all gone. Not a drop left. Why are you telling me this? We can't let the celebration end like this. And Etcher's family humiliated. Boys, uh, go join the others. I'll be right there. Mm. not yet come. If not now, when? Please. Hmm. 
Tú eres el agitador. Y you see that very human, boy like, mommy like relationship that is special and fun. How does that compare to the relationship you have with your own mom? Uh, well, being somebody who kind of works as a, a method actor, as we discussed earlier, uh, I brought my relationship with my mother into that relationship with Jesus, between Jesus and the Blessed Mother. Oh. So uh, for me, I, I, you know, one of the things when you first see us meet in episode five before the wedding of Cana, um, I kind of pick her up, I bear hug her and I spin her around. And, and that was something that I wanted to do because that's how I greet my mother when I haven't seen her in a while. And, um, and my mother's, they're about, funny enough, they're about the same height, my mom's petite. And so it's an easy thing to do. And anytime I pick her up, she's literally like laughing because she just, she, her feet are like two feet off the ground at that point. So, um, it would, it's just a moment of joy for me. And, uh, and I just made sure Dallas was cool with that. And he's like, yeah, yeah, do whatever. So, and he's been, you know, great, uh, with, with allowing us to bring our own personal, you know, um, nuggets of, of, uh, our, our own lives into the show uh, as uh, through our characters. So you're in LA, you're getting mm -hmm. situated, you're getting started, you're, you have an agent. Yeah, that was part of the reason why I felt really good about it. So I came out in the fall of 2009. Mm -hmm. I had done a sort of reconnaissance trip in 20, uh, 2007 and um, I had met with some people that said, if you were here, we would work with you. So I did another trip where you're meeting casting directors and agents and managers on this trip in fall of 2009. And then I got signed out of that. And I was like ready and I just needed a sign uh, to, to, to show me that that was the right decision. Right. So the sign was getting signed. Right. And so I said, great. And then I, three months later, I was here. Yeah. And I didn't go out once for like nine months. Like I had nothing. I, I, I said, well, maybe it just takes a little time. And then all of a sudden, you know, it dawned on me. I'm like, I, this isn't, yeah, I got to get out of this because this is not working. And I, I made my own relationships. I met other people. I found my other, my own auditions other ways, but that was hugely frustrating. You know, Did you start to doubt the, the, the fact that you had this sign that you suddenly, you know, to come out there and be out there? Did you start to question your whole purpose? I couldn't understand it. I didn't understand why they would sign me. And, and I've heard a myriad of, of reasons that are, are not positive as to wh how that could happen or sure. why an agency would maybe do that or what the, you know, so I just, I tried to not listen to the negative stuff and just try to do the, I'm a, I'm a, I'm, I'm an optimist. I'm a glass half full kind of guy. So I'm like, okay. And also as a, as my experience working in the film industry as a location manager, specifically as a location manager, but, but almost any other um, department, but when you're the head of a department or the, or the assistant, the second, you know, in command of a department, your job is to problem solve. And on a film set as a location manager, you're dealing, you're the liaison. Anytime you go to a new location to shoot the day scenes, you're now the liaison between, you know, 15 department heads, uh, a crew of about a hundred, and then the person who owns that location, that property. And you got to basically have your eyes everywhere, make sure people aren't breaking stuff, make sure they're not in rooms they're not supposed to be on, make sure they're not planting a grip stand on, you know, the newly sodded turf outside of the, of the property, um, of the home or whatever. And so you're constantly fielding questions and, there's always going to be a fire. So you have to really get good at problem solving and not focusing on why, why, why it's just like, all right, this is the situation. What am I going to do about it? How am I going to fix it? How am I going to move forward? How are we going to, how am I going to have success at this point? Yeah. So I had, there was only so much I could do. Um, the thing that I, I kind of just uh, um, procrastinated was letting go of that relationship, which I learned I, I would never wait that long again to, to do that sort of a thing. Uh, is to you know for for uh, nary an audition in eight months would ne would never happen again. But that 
you know, as I look back now, I can see that if they had not signed me then, I might not have come out here then. Things yep. may have been True. different. I might not have found my destiny. So I have to look at everything through the lens of God. God decides um, what, as long as he knows I have a willing heart, he's going to decide what's best for me. And then it's up to me to just sort of recognize that, even if I don't see it. And at the time, I didn't see it. I wouldn't have seen it like that, um, especially compared to now. But I would just say, well, you brought me here for something. I don't know what, but I'm pretty sure this is still it. So maybe it's just to kind of, you know, build up my skin, you know, thicken my skin out here and figure out what the next move is and, and learn from this. Somehow. Well, it reminds me, obviously, of the scene in The Chosen where you're at the well and you're waiting. Mm -hmm. And we're all waiting as we watch that scene. Is that woman coming? Because you you said you were going to be meeting somebody. Jesus says, I'm going to be meeting somebody here. Tells the disciples just go in town and do their thing. And so, you know, it's kind of like that moment where you know something's supposed to happen. Something's going to happen. But then you start to go, when? When is it going to happen? Yeah. And, and <laughs> there's a word called long suffering in the scriptures everywhere. Mm -hmm. God is, God has long suffering, meaning he can patiently wait for good things to come. And I guess an optimist, that's the only way to survive that is to be an optimist. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what's your alternative? Right. You know, and you've been doing quite a bit. You've done the newsroom, interns, NCIS, you did Ballers, Heart of Dixie, Council of Parenthood, yeah. Law and Order. You did a couple soap operas. And yeah, the list goes on. A lot of voiceover work, Wonder Pets. My kids will be happy about that, knowing that oh, Jesus yeah. is on Wonder Pets. <laughs> all, all those things. And um, it, it leads to this massive role that you are now part of, which is you are the main character in one of the most important, what I believe is one of the most important series that has found a way to be self-funded, but he says, we're gonna do this in complete, you know, season one, season two, we're gonna go all the way to the resurrection, slowly and carefully, as a, a way of building the character in such a profound way that by the time we see you crucified, we're all gonna be dying inside. Now you have this major role. How did you feel about all that? knowing that you would be the son of God? Well, you know, I think having played um, Jesus before for Dallas specifically in three other projects kind of gave us that shorthand that um, I knew that we'd have on set. Um, from the beginning, there's, it's it's been um, made, public what the goal is. The goal is, God willing, eight seasons, right? Of eight episode per season for the show. But from the beginning, there's never been any idea that anything is set in stone. The most I knew is that we were moving forward with a series that we would shoot at least four episodes. Hopefully we would get to shoot all eight for a season. And then hopefully, Maybe we get a couple of seasons. And if we were really lucky, seven or eight seasons by the time the series is done. So I've learned to not think about the, the entire scope of what it is. I think I, my head would probably explode if I tried to really consider what it was that we were trying to tackle here. And I think God is very smart in his design with how he disseminates information. Um, and, and our experiences on, on earth and in life, um, knowing what we could and couldn't handle. Okay. And I think also keeping us in faith and as, um, as Dallas and his wife, Amanda Jenkins say, uh, keeping us on the, the manna program, the loaves and fishes yeah. where, um, you know, with the manna program specifically, it's like, you just get that day's bread. You know, give us this day our daily bread, not your weekly bread, not your monthly bread. 
today's bread. Let's eat today and worry about That's today. Good. Tomorrow has worries all its own. So um, I've often uh, re reflected on that and I refer to that in my own life. So um, it's not really, I don't really think about it so much. I just, I know that it's important. I know that there is um, a lot of people that are going to be affected by this. And my only, if I'm lucky on a good day, my only thought is, or my only prayer is that, Lord, let people see not my face today or hear me speaking, but hear Jesus speaking and hear the sp spirit speaking through me and, and see Jesus within me um, portraying these, uh, you know, reenacting these scenes out of scripture. And then everything that's extra biblical, it's in between scripture, let that be inspired by scripture and let it be, let it resonate with people so that they turn to scripture and that they're inspired by the word themselves and to explore and to meet Jesus themselves in the Bible. Now having this, hopefully this uh, relatability that perhaps they didn't have before or, or, you know, debunking these myths about, you know, who the son of God might have been and what it would have meant to, uh, to meet him uh, as a human being on this planet. What's, you know, did he laugh? Did he, did he dance? Did he smile? Did he do these things that we're portraying in the show? And, and if we really believe that he was a hundred percent human as well as a hundred percent divine, a uh, hundred percent human and everything of, except sin, of course, if we really believe yeah. that, um, then we have to believe he experienced everything to every degree that we did and then some. So um, that's what we're trying to depict is Jesus' humanity and how and the disciples' humanity. Uh, they're not just, you know, icons on stained glass. They are they were living, breathing people like you and I sitting here right now having this conversation. Yeah. And if people can relate to Jesus through their eyes and their experiences and then and be affected by him, then maybe we too can be affected by Christ. It's fascinating way. because I'm talking to you and I'm talking to Jonathan. I don't it, it's amazing how you were able to create you know, under Dallas's guidance, that character that, uh, of Jesus, because it's clearly a separate entity from who you are, you know, and in the music world, mm. you have performers, but then when you meet them, they're just, you know, it's just average guys, um, smart, intelligent, creative people under control. Um, humility, I believe is called is strength under control. And uh, mm. you embody that. And yet, You've created this Christ that people are posting images of that Christ as their Christ on mm. Facebook. And, you know, of uh, me personally, I've shared a couple things and, you know, I, 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 I witness and I, I share my feelings a lot about Jesus and I've started using that image. And it's interesting because I don't even put Jonathan in that image. That's how well you've done that job. The other thing that you're doing that's fascinating, I know that you do a lot of advocacy work for uh, Catholicism, and you've been doing prayers, prayer hours nightly. And my wife is Catholic. And so sometimes I, I say, what, you know, I lean over in bed and I say, What are you listening to? She goes, I'm listening to Jonathan do the rosary. Oh, wow. Because wow. Wow. it sounds like what an honor. Jesus is doing the rosary for her. And she's having these sacred wow. spiritual experiences. She's drawing closer to her, her, to God, because of the work you're doing. And we're just one family, Jonathan. And that's what's brilliant wow. about the gift that God has given you. We never know. That's we never know the lives that are impacted by the choices we make that are all heart to just be the best we can, do the best we can, and it expands beyond. So I'm grateful for the gift God gave you and the ability to, to, to create what you've created. I do think that it's, uh, it's uh, you know, it's, if we go to the business side of things, it's Oscar worthy, it's Emmy worthy. 
and I believe you've already wow. won wow, thank you. a movie guide award. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, they they've been super supportive, uh, and they're lovely, lovely people. And the um, movieguide.org, I didn't, I hadn't heard of them until we got nominated for this thing. And Dallas had been nominated before for some of his earlier work, um, but uh, I never heard of them. And then I started reading up on them. And then at the awards, before the actual awards are given out, we we were given a little presentation by Dr. Ted Baer. Uh, about the state of, of the faith-based industry and and how, and I had no idea about this, but they are almost, if not always successful financially. Like statistically speaking, like faith-based, family-inspired, family-minded uh, films will always make money um, than or anything else like above and beyond. And, and, and the fact that like Hollywood doesn't capitalize on that more is, it just kind of gives you an idea as to what's going on in, in Hollywood. Yes. But um, I had no idea about that. And so their, their whole thing is to encourage and reward and, and, and push on these, um, and inspire these uh, filmmakers to continue to make this kind of content because not only is it uh, uplifting and, and morally encouraging, but it's it's financially rewarding. It's like God is sort of rewarding these people for being faithful to Him, and and these are people that really have God on their hearts. They're, it's not you know a Hollywood version of a Bible epic that's you know they've got big names and they're trying to make a buck, but these are smaller companies that are making stuff that they really want to get out there. And then it's, it's mostly message driven. Do you think the chosen, obviously with the crowdfunding that's happened, you got 19,000 people from all over the world. I know a lot of people from my home state of Utah raised a lot of money uh, for, for the chosen. Do you think that's gonna help break down some of the walls so that, so that filmmaking can be done in a more personal way that reaches a specific demographic rather than just trying to do something that's um, not as meaningful or because it seems like most of the most of the movies that come out these days are void of any atonement. It's man's atonement. It's they try to find redemption in some alternative universe. And I always go, yeah. where is God in this? Because people are religious, people are spiritual. That's always removed from film. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think, I think it has definitely inspired uh, people to, to try to approach filmmaking differently. Um, I also recognize that what we've done and what we've accomplished thus far is an anomaly and can only be attributed to the Holy spirit working through this project. Mm -hmm. So I think if people want to harness the spirit and, and they have that within them and they want to make films that, um, want to be able to to give glory to god in some way I, I think if it's god's will for it to move forward anything can happen um i i think it's it is uh you know i i couldn't ha give you any kind of predictive answer on on the metrics of that because it just it's it's never been done before could it be done again i, I think so um but i think it would have to be the right project and the right audience um so, you know, it's, uh, it, it's something that we're, we still kind of scratch our heads and say, how did this happen? You know, how did this, we, we just consider ourselves, all of us involved, like just so blessed that it's gone where it's gone. Because, I mean, if you've heard Dallas's story, like he, when, when the guys over at uh, Vid Angel uh, said, uh, hey, we, we want to crowdfund this uh, with, uh, you know, using the, uh, his film, The Shepherd, which was about the nativity of Jesus is seen through the eyes of the shepherd. Um, we want to crowdfund this um, ourselves and we think we could raise money to do the series. And Dallas's response is like, you're crazy. Like you'd be lucky if you raise $800. Like literally those were his words. And, you know, 10 plus million dollars later, we got season one shot and, and now we're halfway funded through season yeah. two. Um, through a pay it forward program, not even the same thing we did before. Like the second season is being funded completely differently from the first season. So everything about this, I mean, the, 
the the line from episode is it seven uh get used to different could not be more applicable to this uh this series to this the concept of what we've been able to do here um and what dallas and his team have been able to do um, i didn't do any of that um i just showed up and, and said yes and that's been my thing is just like just say yes just yeah. go with it and uh and and i think as a result like a perfect storm has kind of um put us in the in the position we are today but everybody from the top down to the distributors like it's like what does god want us to do i mean that's their hearts like the, the guys at mid-angel they i mean they're some of the most beautiful smartest marketing guys but their hearts are are for, for christ yep. you know and so that they're there that's where the, this paid forward program came it's like you can watch it for free and if you felt feel that it's affected your life in a positive way you know pay it forward for 15 bucks you can have the the series on your phone permanently and then 10 other people who maybe can't afford to watch this the 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 series in like uganda who have smartphones can watch the show about jesus and know about jesus you know, like that's that's the brilliance of that system they came up with that so everything's been inspired and driven by the holy spirit throughout this entire process and so I just, uh, I just pray to just be able to keep saying yes and, and that God keeps me on the path. It's a remarkable, remarkable journey. And you obviously, you know, there's so much ahead for you, not just with The Chosen, but in all these other roles that God is going to bring to you. Uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's going to be exciting to watch your career continue to evolve and grow. You know, you are becoming a very well-known household name and, uh, that's mm -hmm. got to bring some sense of comfort. And yet, you know, you have to still go out and find the jobs and audition and all those things. As we conclude here on, on uh, All Heart, I, I always ask my guests, and I had Dallas on, I ask my guests, years from now, when we're all gone, what is it that you hope people who knew you remember most? about who Jonathan Rumi was. Was he driven? Was he led? Who was Jonathan Rumi? What, what do you um, I think, I would hope that people would feel that I sought God with my heart and hoped to encounter him at every turn in my life and to share those encounters with other people, especially those that are searching for meaning in their life. And that perhaps if I could lead them to a deeper experiential relationship with their creator, uh, that would be pretty amazing. What's one thing people can do that you've done to help you feel God's love and grace and the uh, motivation to to just continue to enjoy this beautiful world that's very complex and a lot of painful it's a lot of pain in this world but what advice amidst all the darkness and the sadness how do you how do you how do you bring the light into your life i'm going to adapt something that i kind of say in my prayer hours um the first thing I would say is be humble, uh, be bold. If you're going to share your faith with anybody, you got to be bold, but you got to be humble and you got to lead with love. But I think that the biggest thing is to be humble because I think if you, if you have a, a sense of humility, everything else has the, 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 the soil is tilled for all other human virtues to take root in a person's uh, spirit. And then you're now able to, um, people will want to, they will be open to you. If they think you have a chip on your shoulder or you have ownership on the truth and you know what uh what god's saying but nobody else does uh you, you lost your you you can't you can't be an effective witness yeah. so 
I think the biggest thing is、uh, be humble, and then everything else will have room to grow. Thank you for listening to All Heart with Paul Cardall. This has been part one of a three-part series about the chosen. On the next couple episodes, you'll meet the creator, the writer, and the director of this incredible, inspiring series, Dallas Jenkins. On the next All Heart.